privilege of introducing our speaker today, Liette Ben Moshe. In just a minute here. Uh, Liette Ben Moshe is an activist scholar working at the intersection of incarceration, abolition, and disability madness. Author of uh, Decarcerating Disability, Deinstitutionalization and Prison Abolition. This is from the University of Minnesota Press. And um, the co-editor of Disability Incarcerated. She is an associate professor of criminology, law and justice at the University of Illinois, Chicago. So I'm gonna turn it over to Liette, who's gonna present to us for about 40, 45 minutes. At that point, I'll come back in to introduce how discussion will be facilitated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, good morning. Um, a few more housekeeping things. If people don't have masks, there's masks uh, in the uh, registration table. And also since um, uh, if people can't wear masks, uh, if you can just be in the back of the room or kind of go in and out. Uh, that will be great. So uh, thank you so much for uh, Socialism for inviting me. Uh, thanks for people who are coming. Um, if we can leave a door uh, open, unless it's like really noisy. Yeah, just for like airflow. Yeah, thank you. I know this like for a lot of us, the first kind of in-person <laughs> breathing each other's air conference. Thank you so much. Um, last announcement for me. Um, uh, there's three doors like in the room. If you see people that are kind of like congregating in the back, they can also come through other doors. And also if people can, you know, just look look at kind of w what's going on and, and give each other like space. All right, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Um, I come from really the field of disability studies, the disability culture. Um, disabled people are my people. I think it's important to say that, you know, where are we coming from? Um, I'm also an abolitionist, and a lot of what I try to do is to bridge <laughs> those two things. Um, so a lot of my work is really um, to show to disability activists and disabled people, mad people, um, what to understand abolition better, and also to understand the uh, critiques and the problems with making demands to the state to fix problems that the state made. Um, and then to um, people who are more kind of abolitionist or leftist or revolutionaries, I try to show how disability is a political and potentially politicizing uh, entity. So what I'm going to do today, 40 minutes um, is a really long time, so I'll do various things. One is, um, welcome, um, one is really going to start with very kind of basic things. So if you're very familiar with disability culture um, and disability justice, then you know just scribble on your phone for like seven minutes, but uh, that's going to be the first part. Um, and the point is really that I want to make is why should you care about disability and madness in your organizing and analysis? Um, and then I'm going to talk about deinstitutionalization as a precursor to abolition or deinstitutionalization as abolition. And I'm going to give an example of labor organizing and then some lessons from deinstitutionalization that uh, are kind of like take take home uh, lessons about abolition. And then I'm gonna end with a brief lessons about right now, um, because a lot of my work is more historical about 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, 60s, 50s, so on. But I'm gonna end with now. All right, so first of all, I thought I would start very basic. Um, and again, apologies for those that this is familiar to. But um, there's various ways to understand disability and madness, and I wanna be very clear when I say disability and madness, what that means. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, the, the common understanding of disability is that it's uh, medical, it's something that the doctor prescribed, something that gets you like uh, disability benefits, um, um, something that uh, can be fixed or should be fixed, uh, something that should be treated, reduced, it's a lack of an ability, it's some kind of a deficit, and it's definitely an individual matter, right? Like what's your disability? How did you become disabled? Um, and so on. But 
the way that we understand disability, we uh, in disability studies, med studies, uh, people who are um, part of disability cultures, part of um, med pride, we understand disability as um, something that's socially constructed. So it's something that derives its meaning from historical, cultural, political, and economic structures. It's not something that's inherent in people's bodies and minds. Nobody has a disability. Really important to say, N nobody does. Um, the disability comes from interaction with the environment. People have impairments, um, which are also, by the way, not necessarily deficit-driven and all that. But people are disabled by environment, whether the environment is attitudinal, uh, economic, um, physical environments, and so on. And so people are, are disabled by uh, social circumstances. Also, which by the way, I mean, it's really important to say that the state defines disability. Um, the state defines disability often very loosely to marginalize people, but then very uh, rigidly if you ask for resources, right? So this is just one example. You can see how disability defined a person is still exactly the same, has the same impairment or has the same um, you know, mental difference and so on. But the way that we define disability um, changes over time and space. But I, I think a lot of you know this. But also, <laughs> disability and madness are an identity. And they have a culture and they're a political identity, and I think it's very important to say this in socialism. It's a political identity. Now, not everybody that's disabled or deaf, deaf with a capital D, um, or mad, mad as in um, crazy, uh, not just angry, um, not everybody identifies or is politicized as disabled. I mean, I was disabled for a really long time before I was politicized as disabled. Um, and I think that that's also by design, like any other identity and consciousness. You know, not uh, everybody's a feminist, not that everybody is a leftist and so on. And I think that, um, again, there's a lot of barriers to identification with disability and to understanding disability culture. So why should you think of yourself um, as, as disabled or why should people kind of politicize themselves um, if they um, are disabled but not necessarily, you know, they shy away from that as a categorization or identity. Um, and I think a lot of us think about disability as, uh, you know, there's a lot of oppression in relation to that, but it's also generative, it's productive, it's a way to view the world. It produces knowledge and produces particular uh, ways of resistance. But also, of course, it's um, it's a source of both pride and oppression. And I wanted to uh, read to you a definition of ableism uh, that I'm gonna kind of build on. Um, this is from T.L. Lewis. Um, and this definition really is built with uh, disabled people of color kind of coalitionally. And this is a quote, um, ableism is a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. And at the end of the definition, which is much longer, um, TL says, you do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. This is not to say we're all disabled. Please don't say that. It's not true. And also, uh, we all experience ableism, also uh, not necessarily true. You, we, can, we can all experience ableism, but we don't experience it equally, just like we all not experience sexism equally and so on. There's like a power differential um, here. But what I wanted to um, really highlight here is that productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, fitness, um, they all are also related to um, the construction of, um, um, again, to labor extraction um, and so on. And, and a lot of these things are also built on, of course, colonialism and anti-blackness and so on. So, what I want to talk about today is a particular form of resistance to 
uh, incarceration, a particular form of abolition that comes from the knowledge of mad and disabled people, and that is uh, deinstitutionalization um, more kind of specifically. Um, I just wanted to say before I delve into that for the next, um, you know, about half an hour or so, um, that the, this also comes from an understanding of disability justice, and disability justice is not the combination of those two words, disability and justice. Um, disability justice is a particular framework. Um, it's a particular framework that comes from the lived experience of disabled people of color, on, of queers with disabilities, uh, trans and gender non-conforming people with disabilities, um, indigenous people with disabilities, and so on. And it's a framework that emphasizes things like intersectionality, cross-movement solidarity, and is a very strong anti-capitalist um, politic at its heart. So it's not something that's kind of added to it. This is what disability justice means. People who don't know what it is, um, you should look into since, since invalid definition of disability justice. The thing that's really important um, for me to say that here is that disability justice brings to our analysis of incarceration and understanding that incarceration happens in more than prisons and jails. Incarceration is a process that also happens uh, in nursing home. It happens um, in residential facilities for people with intellectual disabilities. It happens in psychiatric hospitals. Um, and this is not to say that psychiatric hospitals are like prisons, but they are all um, carceral spaces. They're different, but they're all carceral spaces. It's also to say that medicalization is another uh, conduit to um, both criminalization and to incarceration. And to say that the carceral state and the therapeutic state are incredibly tied together. And I hope you'll see that um, throughout the talk. So what I bring to this, and then I'll just give you kind of the rest of the time is like the example. Um, what I bring to this is what I called a CRIP, um, C-R-I-P, CRIP or Mad of Color Critique of Incarceration and Abolition. And what I mean by, um, you know, CRIP is a reclaimed term by people with disabilities. Um, mad uh, is a reclaimed term, just like queer is a reclaimed term. And what this CRIP or Mad of Color Critique does is that it's not just about people who identify or are even politicized as disabled people of color who are caught up in the system of policing and incarceration, but it's also um, about centering the experiences of disablement and ableism in criminal, racial, and social justice movements. And here I wanna pause and say that uh, ableism uh, labor extraction, carcerality, police, policing uh, were and are constructed on anti-blackness and on colon colonialism, even though they don't only operate on the bodies of people of color. And this is why this is a crip or mad of color critique. Um, it's bigger, um, of course, um, than particular populations, but it's definitely something that was constructed on anti-blackness, uh, uh, ableism, and colonialism. So, again, um, my example is deinstitutionalization as a knowledge of resistance, deinstitutionalization as abolition. And the reason why I think this is really important, and this is the kind of quote unquote cultural competency that I want to bring to you today, the cultural competency of mad and disabled people's knowledge, is that a, when we, um, a lot of us who are abolitionists um, talk about abolition, people say it could never happen, or it can't happen now, or if it happens, it will happen in like Sweden or Norway. People always say Norway, Sweden. Um, but surely not in the US, right? Surely not now, not in the system that we have now, capitalism and all that, uh, racism. But it already happened. <laughs> Spoiler. Um, so abolition, this is like my whole point, um, one of my points for today, abolition already happened. Um, and it happened in the form of the closure of large state institutions for people who are disabled. So I define the institutionalization in three ways. One is the transition of people with psychiatric or intellectual or developmental or other disabilities from state institution and hospitals into community living. Right, where did people end up? 
It's also the closure of these facilities, right? So abolition is about building, absolutely, but it's also about shutting shit down. And this is you know, part of the definition of the institutionalization. But what I add to that is that deinstitutionalization is not just a process, not just something that happened, um, but it's a, a logic, it's a framework, it's a movement. But instead of learning from the lessons of deinstitutionalization for abolition, it is often blamed for the rise in incarceration. Um, and in, in my book and a lot of my work, um, I try to uh, you know, push against that. Um, just to say very briefly, the deinstitutionalization w was not the culprit in the rise of incarceration and the crisis of mental health in prison. Um, again, spoiler alert, the crisis of mental health in prison happens because of prison. Um, and people who are quote unquote homeless or housing insecure and you know, we know this kind of like re revolving door story, right? Like people exited psychiatric institution, they happened they went on, um, you know, on the streets and then they ended up in prisons and in jails. This is not an accurate story of how, first of all, deinstitutionalization happened. And secondly, it blames deinstitutionalization for really big structural issues, like the complete annihilation of affordable, accessible housing at exactly the same time that money started going to corrections. Um, so this is why we see a rise in incarceration. This is why we see um, also uh, a decimation of the welfare state, because those happened exactly at the same time. Um, what we call Reaganomics and later on neoliberalism, this is what we're talking about. So blaming the institutionalization for that also diverts attention from this basically state abandonment, as uh, Ruthie Gilmore calls it. By painting the institutionalization as the culprit, um, it also, um, leaves the disabling effect of incarceration itself intact. Like we don't critique the fact that the reason why there's so many disabled and uh, crazy people, people who experience mental health crisis in prison is because of prison, it's because of jail, it's because of incarceration itself, it's because of trauma, it's because of things like um, um, strip searches, which are nothing but basically sexual assault that happened to people day in and day out. Uh, I could give more examples, but I don't want to trigger people. But prisons, um, jails, very disabling, very maddening. And if we blame the institutionalization, we don't actually get to the root of the problem here. Um, another thing, well, let me move on to like my kind of uh, second example here. So in 2012, this is for people who are Chicago, um, oh. Um, people who might remember this. In 2012, the governor of uh, Illinois at the time, uh, Pat Quinn, announced the closure of a variety of carceral facilities. Um, so this was the um, fruits of, of fighting for the institutionalization in the state of Illinois. He announced he's going to close two developmental center, um, uh, psych hospitals, two juvenile correction facilities, a women's prisons, and uh, TAMS, the only supermax prison in Illinois. And although, although this was driven by a larger policy, uh, the plan to close down these facilities also came as a result of really targeted activism. So um, clap yourself in the room if you were a part of that. Um, the problem, one of the issues was though that a lot of the people who were part of this organizing didn't really kind of talk to each other. So the de institutionalization activists and people who do anti-prison work often don't uh, talk to each other. So one of the examples that I want to uh, bring to you is the example of fighting against um, this anti-closure uh, arguments and fighting for it together. So uh, who do you think resists, so who do you know if you were a part of that struggle? Um, who resists the closure of carceral facilities like prisons and um, psychiatric hospitals? Who's against it? Unions, the guards, unions. Guards, unions. You can just speak, I'll, I'll revoice. Experts. Experts. Politicians with special interests. Fascists. <laughs> Fascists, police. Insurance companies. Oh, insurance companies. Pharmaceuticals. Some mental health providers. 
some mental health providers. Great, so these are the people, but great, I mean awful, but these are the kind of main uh, people, and those are people that, that resist both the closure of prisons and um, disability institutions. It's people who have kind of an economic interest in it. Um, so it's unions, workers, people with economic stake, politicians. In the arena of uh, disability, uh, unfortunately, it's also parents. Um, parents for people with disabilities, especially intellectual disabilities, some of them are very much against the closure of institutions. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. So um, there's a lot of differences between prisons and institutions, but when you go to rallies against closure, which I have, um, of these various carceral facilities, um, the, the picture is very similar. It's people usually mobilized by the union, um, and they are, um, have signs that say something like save blah, blah, blah facility, um, you know, something about um, jobs, something about safety always, something about safety or something about danger. Um, and the, the safety in disability arenas is often the safety of the people inside, right? Like they will not be safe on the outside. Um, if this institution closes, they will die on the streets or they will die in whatever the community. Um, but uh, in prison, it's usually the safety of the people on the outside, right? Like we can't release dangerous people. It's also about the safety of the workers often. Um, and there's also a lot of discourse around choice in home, like don't, in, especially in the disability arena, don't close my home. And often the place is called something, something home, like nursing home or um, convalescent home and so on. So this uh, issue of um, uh, closure is a lot of around notions of choice, notions of home, notions uh, of labor, and a lot, of course, about the political economy of incarceration itself, because institutions and prisons are seen as an engine of economic growth. They're seen as sites of employment, which is why there's a lot of um, resistance from union, of course, both AFSME, um, AFS, S C M E um, and the police and prison officer union, and you know in that regard, um, uh, James Kilgore, who's a longtime uh, abolitionist um, and formerly incarcerated activist, um, I don't know if he's here, but um, he asks whether or not the task of a union is to represent the interest of the members or the working class more generally? And I think this is a very big question for guard unions um, and unions in uh, disability institutions as well. So of course, despite the opportunity to create coalition building between labor movements, disability right movement, uh, prison, it's often the case that union represent one of the staunchest critiques against uh, abolition or closure of uh, prisons and institutions. And in relation to deinstitutionalization, for example, um, AFSME, um, I'm sure you all know, it stands for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employee Union. Um, in the 70s, they were really big uh, against deinstitutionalization, and they still are. Um, and they wrote these reports and um, um, got ads in uh, the radio, remember the radio? Yeah, the thing, before Spotify, yeah, you know, um, really like they took up space uh, and time and money to show um, how deinstitutionalization means dumping people in the streets um, and how people are gonna end up like in jails. So um, remember what I said earlier about this kind of like false narrative about blaming deinstitutionalization, it started and it didn't start, but it was spread by stuff like this, so just to kind of give you a heads up. Um, but moving on more like to today, um, the, the interest to keep these places open is of course economical, but it's also often couched in terms of uh, the best interests of, of the people, especially in disability arena where the impetus is not just to work, but the impetus um, or what workers are told in these spaces is that they also need to care, right? These are called um, you know, care facilities. And so it's really important to also think about the effective, with an A, the effective economy of care, not just the kind of political economy of care. I don't have a lot of time to get into it today, but um, a lot of people write about the effective economies of care. Um, and the reason why I'm saying effective with an A is because it's about uh, eliciting these um, you know, kind of emotional registrars. Um, 
and particularly you know, thinking about who does the caring. So in order to understand the resistance to closure of carceral um, places, it's important to understand the differences and similarities between employees who work in these spaces. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for Illinois, just as an example, correctional officers make an average of $27 um, an hour, while home health aides, psychiatric aides, uh, nursing assistants, orderlies make between 11 and 14 an hour. So this is not the same. Um, the stakes are not the same in these two facilities. The benefit for keeping institutions and prisons open is, of course, economic, but there's a lot of difference, especially in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender as well as pay rate in terms of employees. In addition, the discussion about unions um, and their resistance to closure of carceral spaces often paints the working class in very masculine terms. You know, we've seen uh, in our heads guards, um, prison guards, um, union leaders. And although that is not true to all carceral facilities, um, the um, and, and this is, again, this is not true to all carceral facilities if we add disability institutions into, uh, into the mix. Um, it's, it's of course true that in penal facilities, uh, meaning prisons, these are mostly white and masculine. Even if the job is held by women, the jobs are still masculine jobs. Um, the case in disability settings today is almost the mirror image of that because most workers are women uh, and of color, a lot of uh, migrant workers, and the job is very feminine because you're supposed to care, right? So this is a nurturing kind of job. So I think we, my point is to, uh, we have to think coalitionally about these spaces, but we have to understand the differences as organizers in order to really, when we talk about the union resistance, who is the union, what do they represent, and what is the workers also beyond the union, uh, what is the workers, because the unions don't always represent uh, the workers, um, you know, what, um, who are the workers in these facilities? And especially with the institutionalization, a lot of disability support staff now works primarily in the private sectors for companies that hire them to work directly in the homes of disabled people. So the question for unions and to workers who care is how to respond to the changing economic and social realities of deinstitutionalization, for example, in ways that get their economic and emotional needs met without holding on to either defunct industries um, or uh, in any industry that's really morally bankrupt um, and more, uh, warehouses people for care or profit or both. Um, and in this case, it doesn't matter if it's care or profit um, or both. So, and the, the other thing I want to say is that alternatives to incarceration and useful home care responses also have to be feminist because the people who do this care work, of course, are uh, feminized, uh, uh, are women. Uh, people who do this care work now for people with disabilities are often family members of people with disabilities post um, I wouldn't say we're in post deinstitutionalization by the way, Illinois is very worst in the, um, one of the worst states in decarcerating and closing down facilities for people with disabilities. Um, there's, anyway, we can talk later about that, but um, it's really one of the worst. But in places where there was a big kind of move to deinstitutionalize, a lot of people now live with their family members. And I'm sure you can understand that it's mostly either mothers or siblings that uh, do the care work and of course are not paid um, to do that as care work goes. Um, but I wanted to end with an example and then move to another, um, and then move towards like more conclusionary stuff like take home lessons. In 2012, when the governor of Illinois announced this potential closure that I was describing earlier, um, he also talked about the closure of TAMS, um, the supermax prison in Illinois. And at that time, mothers of people who were incarcerated in TAMS marched to AFSCME quarters in Chicago carrying signs stating, I am a mom and my son is not a paycheck. These signs alluded, of course, to placards um, held by sanitation workers, um, black men who worked in Memphis um, in 1968, which is the last protest Martin Luther King Jr. participated in that said, um, 
right? I mean, they're saying I am a mom. The, those uh, placards said I am a man. This was an attempt to utilize the trope of motherhood to bring um, to light another quote unquote, civ the civil rights issue of our time, which is mass incarceration and its relation to racism and to capitalism. My son is not a paycheck. By the powerful use of these uh, gendered uh, dynamics of motherhood, the protesters tried to show AFSME as the guards union that it was on the wrong side of history. But in the institutional arena, this is much more complex. This is what I was alluding to earlier. There are a lot of parents um, a lot of them are mothers, uh, but parents in general, that really use the notion of rights and choice to talk about how their kids need to stay in institutions. And um, I want to say that we have to think about this structurally. Uh, choice became a prominent idea. Choice is not a neutral term. It became a prominent idea in a neoliberal context. At the same time that resources to housing, welfare, healthcare, were eroding. So people are made to fight over intentionally depleting resources. Constructing services based on a market economy through this idea of choice, in theory means that people with disabilities and their uh, family would be able to select the best course of action for um, the person. And this is what in disability worlds is called the continuum. The continuum approach means that uh, people with disabilities should be able to live um, in a less restrictive setting and more restrictive settings. So for people with high needs, they would be able to um, be in uh, institutions. For people who um, have lesser needs, they should live in community or can live in community, um, in the community with supports. And in between, there's like nursing homes and um, uh, boarding homes and group homes and all of those things. So this is the idea, and this has been a policy in the disability wor world since the 60s. It's called the continuum or the less restrictive environment, um, if you ever encounter that. So the problem <laughs> with that um, approach is that it validates incarceration as a morally valid choice. It's just one choice out of many. You can either incarcerate somebody or they can live you know, in the community and you choose as if it's a choice at all, especially when, um, <clears throat> especially when living in the community with support is not actually given to people as a quote unquote choice. So I'm not trying at all to vilify parents. I'm just saying that it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it's a capitalistic Ponzi scheme. Um, and unfortunately, people use the language of choice. That there is no choice. But the whole notion of continuing makes it appear as if, if, as if somehow there is. So what are some lessons now? Um, I told you some stories. Uh, what are some lessons that we can learn from deinstitutionalization about abolition specifically? So first of all is a lesson I think which is really important around who can be decarcerated. Some of the most pervasive arguments against deinstitutionalization and prison abolition is the widespread belief that certain people are always gonna need some kind of segregation. They're always going to need to be restrained. Um, some people, um, you know, with quote unquote high support needs, um, are going to need, be need to. Um, they cannot live in the community. I'm just voicing what people say. They cannot live in the community. Some people um, should not be outside of prisons. But what deinstitutionalization shows us is that I analyze in a lot of uh, my work that deinstitutionalization didn't become abolitionary until it kind of went all the way, until it was non-reformist, meaning um, until people, including disabled, uh, disabled people, mad people, their families, experts, said no more, no continuum, no less restrictive environment. Warehousing people is morally bankrupt, close them all. And when that happened, this is when deinstitutionalization became abolitionary. So not all form of deinstitutionalization are abolitionary, but I think this is the lesson. This cannot be a choice. If, you, if we say some people need, it's a ch it, it makes it look viable, and like it is just one choice out of many, but it is not. Genocide is not a choice. 
incarcerating people, caging people. Not a choice, should never be. So the question most often um, talked about, particularly for those who critique abolition, um, is about people who have the most challenging or dangerous quote unquote behaviors. And in pris prison abolition, this is called um, what to do with the dangerous few. Maybe you've heard about it, right? Like a lot of people say, well, let's you know decarcerate, uh, of course, people with um, drug offenses, uh, blah, 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 but surely there'll be people who uh, have to be uh, incarcerated, right? The serial killer, serial rapist, what do we do with those? Um, and and I'm, I'm using that language also because you know, I teach and that's really like the first thing that the students kind of raise their hands like, what about the serial killers? Um, so I, you know, I don't want to kind of divert that question but I just want to say that this is also happens in the realm of disability when people talk about what about the people who with the most significant or profound disabilities. So I see kind of like a mirror um, question here. In both cases, the general assumption uh, is that these are the population that will need that will not be able to kind of make it on the outside, uh, and therefore will always require some sort of segregation and restraint, either for their own good or for the public's good. But through the lens of abolition, or what I was telling you earlier, what I call a crip or mad of color critique or disability justice, we can use this question to develop what Angela Davis called a very different social landscape of a non-carceral society. In other words, um, to me, the question of the dangerous few in regards to um, uh, the question of deinstitutionalization, for example, was to start from the quote-unquote dangerous few. So a lot of uh, institutions that closed down uh, in the arena of intellectual and developmental disabilities, for example, started with the people with the quote-unquote most profound needs. And I mean like really like medical needs, people who you said they will always live in some kind of you know, hospital -y environment. Um, people who have complex you know, behavioral um, needs and so on. But if you start the work of abolition and decarceration from that, then it's very easy to then decarcerate people that have less needs, um, needs for support, medical needs, and so on. So this, I think, is a very profound thing for, um, for us to understand uh, abolition. Because the current focus, unfortunately, especially in criminal justice reform, is on what people call the non-non-nons, right? The non-violent offenders, non-serious offenders. I'm using the word offender because that's the system word. Um, the non-sexual offenders. Like, yes, of course, let's decriminalize uh, marijuana. Uh, maybe decriminalize all drugs. Why are we so progressive? This is amazing. Um, but we don't actually go to the question of, you know, what, are, what about people with actual, you know, real challenging like behaviors? And I think that this is a big lesson from deinstitutionalization is that we have to start there. And I think this is also the core of feminist thinking. This is the core of Black Lives Matter, right? In order for Black Lives Matter, um, um, trans Black Lives need to matter, and so on and so on. You always start from the most marginalized. I mean, this is how liberation happens. I think this also eschews the question of violence because um, the focus on the non-non-nons masks the violence of the state and lets state apparatuses define what violence means. So, you know, if you spit on a guard in, in a prison, that's violence, but incarceration is not. Um, and that is incredibly problematic. And so, as abolitionists say, um, you know, the, the real serial killer is the state. And I think the, the dangerous few question is completely askews um, the, the analysis and what we're talking about. So I promised that I would end, I could go on and on talking about other lessons of deinstitutionalization, but I promised that I would end a little bit with now, um, and this is kind of my conclusion and what is now meaning, you know, I mean, in the US, we are in an era of um, deinstitutionalization. Deinstitutionalization is not a failure, it actually succeeded. It did not lead to um, you know, the rise of incarceration or not in a kind of one-to-one one -one, um, situation. 
Um, again, a lot of states, including Illinois, did not decarcerate as much as we would like them to. But we, you know, we live in a kind of a little bit of a different political economy and social landscape. So what happens now? Well, uh, unfortunately, um, I want to give some examples of how uh, the political econ about the political economy of not incarceration but decarceration. What does it look like now? In 2015. Um, American Friends Service Committee, with grassroots leadership, authored a report called The Treatment Industrial Complex. This is where we're now. We're not just in the institutional industrial complex. We're not just in the prison industrial complex. I think, th I think we're in the treatment industrial complex. Um, by the way, just a footnote, people want to talk in Chicago about this treatment, not trauma thing. Please think about the treatment industrial complex. That's all I'm going to say for now. We can talk more in the Q&A. But the treatment industrial complex shows the shift on the part of the inc incarceration industry into areas like mental health care. And basically what we call alternatives to incarceration. So for example, GEO, which is of course the second largest private prison company in the US, created a subsidiary called GEO Care. Yes, they did, um, which provides mental health services in prison, in addition to operating state psychiatric hospital that, has, that have forensic units. And of course, the irony of a for-profit company providing mental health services to counter the disabling effects of its own prisons um, should not be lost to anybody here. This is what I call carceral ableism, or in this case, carceral sanism, and sanism um, is uh, the oppression that people, it's my timer, um, that people with um, mental health differences face. Um, or actually the imperative to be sane and the pressures uh, and the oppression that is caused by that, that is sanism. So carceral ableism or carceral sanism are the praxis and belief that people with disabilities need special or extra protections in ways that often expand and legitimate their further marginalization and incarceration. For example, mental health jails. Um, I can't tell you how much that is pervasive right now. Uh, you know, in recent meetings um, that I've been at with people who do national kind of organizing against new facility, um, you know, under the banner of no new jails, no new prisons. A lot of these proposed prisons are uh, about um, creating either mental health jails or jails that will help with the opioid crisis so that people can like, you know, sleep it off or whatever. So it's this idea of right geo care. <laughs> it's about caring. We're getting into the caring thing. And it's again, care, and profit or both. And so um, this is one example, drug courts, mental health courts, all of this is carceral ableism and carceral sanism. But I wanna end by saying that I th it might be clear to everybody in this room that you cannot cage people and say that you care. But I want you to also think about the, again, the mad and disabled knowledge that tells us that this is also about biopsychiatry itself. This is not about just what's happening in a cage. This is about the fact that um, people, um, uh, again, um, it's not just about what happens behind bars. It's that biopsychiatry is often the only form of treatment that we think of, and the first course of action for people. So when we say treatment, what do we mean? And do we not mean assimilation? Uh, I think this is a really important question, and this is not just a question about what happens behind bars. And of course, uh, we have you know, the example of uh, community treatment orders, which is basically people are forced to take medication, so when, pharmaceuticals and, and so on. But I'm talking even beyond when people are not forced to take the medications. Um, but also when we say defund police, hire social workers, 
right? W what does that mean? People need more mental health care and not criminalization. Is mental health not related to criminalization? Is it not related to surveillance? Is, does it not lead to further incarceration? Does it not lead people to be then incarcerated in a psychiatric unit? Is a psychiatric unit not carceral? It's not prison, that's true. Um, but is it not carceral? And this is also really important to think about in relation to um, uh, how it's related to racialization as well. So in conclusion, what a crip or mad of color critique of incarceration and abolition might give you I'm just repeating kind of the points um, I've been talking about for 40 minutes, is that um, it's not just about people who identify or are politicized as disabled people of color, although it's incredibly important to recognize the high numbers of people with disabilities who um, get shot by police, for example. But again, it's a framework that's based on the oppression of uh, people of color, particularly anti-blackness and indigeneity, particularly through settler colonialism, it was built through that frame. Ableism is built on that. It's about centering the experiences of disablement and ableism and sanism in criminal, racial, and social justice movement. It's about understanding carceral ableism and carceral sanism. It's about understanding the disabling nature of incarceration itself and not blaming the institutionalization for it. It's about understanding that carcerality happens not just in prisons. And it's about understanding that disability and madness are fundamental to our understanding of incarceration and of abolition. The disability broadens our, concept our conceptualization of incarceration and that criminalization is only one pathway leading to carcerality and surveillance, and criminalization is very tied to racialization, very tied to pathologization. And lastly, that we need a lot of collaboration and coalition building between disability, mad, anti-psychiatry, self-advocates, and prison and police, abolitionists and scholars on the left. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna enter our discussion period. I wanna just remind folks who joined us late that this event is being live streamed, including the discussion. Um, so the way the discussion is gonna work is that we encourage participants to engage with each other. Um, certainly, we wanna get questions out early. So if you have a question, I'm gonna encourage you to uh, raise your hand so you can get on, get on the speakers list. Um, I also, again, want to encourage participants to respond to one another. This is an open discussion amongst the, the participants in the room. Um, there will definitely be opportunity for Liat to come back either at the end or if we have some questions that are, that are stacking up. Um, I'm going to call on you by an article of clothing um, and sort of your approximate location in the room. Um, can people can be given about three minutes to speak. Uh, if I ask you to wrap up, it's not because I don't like what you're saying. Um, it's just that we want to have as much full participation in the room as possible. Um, I'll conclude by just saying that if you can make it to the microphone, please do so. We want to be able to record the discussion. If you're not able to make it to the microphone, um, I'll do my best to um, have the mobile microphone sort of moving around as well. So I'm going to pause for a moment just to get a couple of people on the speakers list, um, and then we'll, we'll begin. Okay, I'm going to ask you to keep your hands up, but I'm going to call on the first list of speakers because uh, a lot of folks just threw their hands up, so that's, that's excellent. I'm going to start with the comrade in the green shirt here, followed by the comrade in the overalls, followed by the comrade in the red bandana. Okay, and then please keep your hands up. Okay, so first of all, and I'm a child psychiatrist, but I want to tell you, I really enjoyed your speech and your perspective because it hits a lot of things that I've been thinking. And I... Uh, feel 
I've been feeling some moral injury from my practice as a psychiatrist because of my concerns about the system. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm a child psychiatrist who's been feeling some moral injury because of the whole way our system is not functioning. I love your term, the treatment industrial complex. I'm going to use that. I'm hoping from my just trying to put some things out there for people today, they can respond to them. So one of the things that's happened in Pennsylvania, talking about carceral spaces, is that they, when I, I'm 66, so I've seen a lot happen. So they got rid of a lot of programs for children that were community and school based and now children go in and out of hospitals and they get pumped up with a lot of medication that they really don't need. This field itself says that 70% of kids don't need the medication they're on. There's been a 4,000% increase in children being placed on medications and they go in and out of these hospital spaces which are dam often do not provide treatment, often um, exacerbate trauma and injury. And uh, my job is just to keep things going but not really address the real needs and issues. Um, I liked how you said don't blame parents. You know, I'm often, when I try to take kids off of the medicines they don't need, I get run up against parents. But then I also understand that parents don't have a lot of options or opportunities for what to do. They're struggling with children who are harmed by society and are disabled because of how society deals with families and children, okay? And then these families don't have options for how do we do things differently. There's not really, so I guess the question for me is, it, what do you envision short of a socialist revolution <laughs> <laughs> that can help to make some kind of change because a lot of children are being harmed in our society, they're uh, and being caused to be de disabled who do not need to be. And what can I do to stop the moral injury for myself? Because I, I really some days feel like, like, like I'm also injured by having to do things that I know are not really the answer and maybe just compounding the problem. I'm just gonna take the mic out um, because I'm tall. Um, but hi, I'm Brianna. Um, I'm an ex-social worker um, who now studies mental health courts and um, treatment in jails and prisons. And uh, my question is partially just related to uh, like the language of prisons and the language of courts and alternatives to incarceration, being really preoccupied with this concept of rehabilitation. Um, I'm super curious about the ways that rehabilitation and sort of healthism um, like begin to intersect with what we see in uh, even like the word corrections. Um, and I think that there's this really interesting like imperative to cure that happens to be particularly prevalent in the criminal legal systems treatment of madness. Um, and I would love to hear from other folks who maybe have thoughts or insights about the ways that uh, our system of quote unquote fixing people um, who have criminal thoughts or behaviors, also in quotes, um, intersects with the way that psychiatry operates around pathologizing um, and treating and assimilating people. Um, yeah, so I, uh, my name's Anna. I have louder okay I have been in and out of like mental health treatment since I was a young teenager and when I have high support needs um, my parents didn't know what else to do other than institutionalize me and so my question is how do we make our communities and our families more viable for um, ourselves and our loved ones to be able to stay home, uh, whether your high support needs are long term or just you know short term. Um, what does that look like for all of us? Okay, um, thank you. So next, I have the person in the red shirt, sort of over here. Yep, you. Followed by the person in the brown shirt right here. 
followed by the person right here with the sort of black jacket on. Hi, my name is Kitty. I'm a retired school nurse, and I have many years of seeing the damage that our uh, failing uh, treatment system, <laughs> you know, medical industrial complex, treatment industrial complex has done to our children. Uh, you know, I've, I've lived through the deinstitutionalization of mental health people and seen, you know, the failures, and I know what I want to see. You know, I want to see people able to live in supportive communities, people able to get whatever they need. Yeah. So I, I have a, you know, a picture of what I want to see, and and how we must make this happen. I don't have a picture yet of what I want to see for the. De in decarcerated uh, serial killers. So I would really, if anybody has an answer to that question, it's like how do we accomplish that? You know, so I yeah, really want to know. I'm very tall, too. Um, first, thank you so much for everything. That was just amazing. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to say more or something more specific about 988 and its development, uh, specifically around the funding of Class 5 psychiatric facilities and how we should channel our advocacy to prevent them and the work that we need to do to uh, support communities to be able to be interdependent. Um, and if you can say also some more <laughs> about peer-run uh, compliant respite centers, that's something that I've been really interested in. Um, I want to say that I'm part of this organization, a startup organization in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts called TART. And one of the things that's been happening in our preliminary calls is that parents with um, children with both physical and developmental disabilities have called us for just child care. There's a person whose child is autistic and she's called us several times just so she could take a nap. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we could offer. Um, and so I'm just thinking about these sorts of things if you have stuff to say on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name's Edward, I'm from Austin. Um, I'm an internist, but I do addiction medicine and uh, integrated medicine. Um, and I'm also autistic and ADHD. Um, and I, I think what I'd like to hear more about is um, not just advocacy for people with disabilities, but also our self-advocacy, right? Nothing about us without us, but also our involvement in our own liberation and our own um, uh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, I, that, that's basically it. I, I think um, the, the medicalization problem I, I've been um, dealing with my entire career, trying to figure out what it is that I'm supposed to do. I, I think we have a, uh, a belief within our training that we are the experts. We know uh, what's needed, what every, everyone needs. But what we really need is uh, a culture where the the person who has the lived experience is the expert, uh, and we are there to to help them meet their own needs and understand their own values and goals. Um, it's only a disability when we're not accommodated for the, the things that make us different. And I think it's really important to also emphasize that that diversity isn't um, an impairment necessarily. It's actually a different way of being, merely. Right? Um, I, I think it's a strength of mine to to look at the world through my autism. Um, and I often wonder what makes the neurotypical think that they see things more clearly than, than I do. In fact, I, I, this, the, the most essential thing there is, I don't understand how neurotypicals think they can read each other's minds, right? <laughs> that's, that's really what they say, and I don't think it's real. I think that leads to a lot of problems rather than solutions, so thank you.
Okay, I'm going to call the next three um, speakers, and then I'm going to pause and um, ask Leah if she wants to come back. So next on the list, I have a person, I think you're wearing purple, but you're right next to your friend with the red head wrap. And then um, right, next, right next door uh, in the black tank top. And then there is somebody in the back row wearing a white shirt on this side. Yes, do you know who you are? Okay, if you're wearing a white shirt and you're towards the back, I might have lost you. Yeah. Um, oh, maybe you're not wearing white. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you'll be third. Yes, you are. Thank you. So you'll be the third speaker, and then we'll kick it back to Leah. Thank you. Hi. Um, so first off, I want to say thank you so much for being here um, and for giving this really brilliant and informative talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, so my question is, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk more about um, after the rise of deinstitutionalization, um, how a lot of care was put into the hands of nuclear family structures and what conversations there have been since about creating greater uh, community systems of care? And what parallels do you see with prison abolition in um, how we can, and what challenges there are in creating those, um, those systems of uh, community accountability? How we can um, do that without uh, resources given by the state? And um, yeah, any examples, especially for um, examples in supporting people with greater needs for support. Thank you. Hi. Oh. Can, am I audible? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, my name is Lou, um, and I'm coming in from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you so much for this talk today um, and making time for discussion and questions, especially. Um, so in Cleveland right now, um, our county, Cuyahoga County, is trying to build another jail um, for half a billion dollars, and they're using, you know, pretty common, like, carceral humanism narratives of, like, you know, we need, the current jail is bad, so we need to have a good jail that's going to be a state-of-the-art facility, you know, it's going to be trauma-informed, people are going to receive services inside, and it's going to be a place of rehabilitation and healing. You know, that's their narrative. Um, and we're coming up, we're like pushing against, we're trying to push against the narratives that there could be such thing as a jail that is trauma-informed. And um, any resources, whether it's like, you know, a podcast or talks or interviews or books, articles um, that kind of go into the depths of that, challenging that would be really, really helpful because there's even, there's trepidation even within the movement to stop the new jail, um, specifically from people who have been incarcerated who don't believe, like, aren't, don't trust that decarceration is possible and so they're very you know they're very concerned with the people who are inside right now it's like what are we how are we supporting them um and along along the lines of the idea that like some people have to be segregated um and so anything that's challenging that would be really helpful um in helping us stop this jail thank you so much Hi. Am I speaking loudly enough? A little louder. Okay. Is this better? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Alina. I'm a disabled abolitionist organizer from California. Um, I have two quick practical questions for some organizers who could not be here today but um, are watching on the live stream. Basically, this is fantastic, by the way. <laughs> um, 
The first one is, I was wondering if you have any advice for abolitionist organizers working on the ground who, when trying to decarcerate people from prison, are usually offered only institutional solutions, especially as it relates to the dangerous few in prison. For example, um, people who are trying to help others off the death penalty are offered, well, maybe you can claim mental health and go to an institution, which are so carceral, so what is the solution to get out of that sort of loop? Um, and the second one is, do you have any advice for getting people out of conservatorship, which in California um, is the process by which people are basically incarcerated in psychiatric hospitals or kind of nicer mental health institutions, um, and they only get a hearing every two weeks and they're not entitled to see us, so we can't get to them and they can't get to us. Um, and we also don't know a way out of that. So sorry, some difficult practical questions. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. I'll uh, thank you so much for this amazing engagement. Um, and I'm going to be very brief because I think you all put a lot of, um, you know, really important provocation to everybody in the room. So I also hope that the next round will respond to the first round. So it's not just kind of like me, um, because you know I'm just uh, one person, um, and all your knowledge matters. Uh, I just want to say real quickly that um, the, the, one of the things that I think is connected to a lot of the questions is about uh, peer, peer support, peer accountability, and mutual aid. And I know that for a lot of people that is not enough of an answer of what is the vision, or what should we do, or what's the alternative, but it really is a lot of that. <laughs> Meaning, you know, if, and that's also the issue with the 988. Um, so specifically with the 988, you know, which is the, the hotline that's been uh, kind of uh, rolled out in recent weeks. Um, it, it used to be a, a hotline for a suicide prevention, and now it's a hotline for everybody in mental health crisis. The idea behind it is that it's um, whoever you call, you know, is not gonna kind of bring armed people into your home. Um, but I don't think that we have enough information about uh, who did the rolling out and how much involvement there was from actual mad people, particularly people of color, particularly people who are closer to uh, this nexus of um, what I call racial, racial criminal pathologization, meaning exactly this kind of nexus that um, creates increased uh, risk to um, death um, and other harms by the hands of uh, police, by the hands of uh, um, doctors, by the hands of incarceration, um, more generally the carceral state. So I think that since we don't know um, how much involvement there was, I'm going to assume that maybe it wasn't prominent. Um, and I think that that becomes very problematic because the people who are going to be harmed by something like 988 is again this whole idea of okay, it's not going to be cops; it will be a social worker. Um, it's going to be you know somebody uh, of that nature. But remember that social workers are also the people that can take away your kids. Um, you know, they're also mandatory reporters. Uh, this is a system of surveillance and tracking. So. Again, I'm not here trying to say everything's bad, why I didn't, you know, not at all, but I want us to just be critical and I want us to think about can uh, we do better and can we create responses that are peer led? Who's the best person to understand somebody in mental health crisis? It's somebody who was in mental health crisis, right? So, for example, there's uh, hearing voices networks, both here and um, you know, uh, uh, globally, and this is, you know, networks of people who literally hear voices that other people don't, and who's the best person to kind of talk to that experience than people who've experienced it, the same with people who experience psychosis, and so on. So I think, yes, peer support. Also, um, in relation to the question about um, community care and accountability and care beyond the state, again, um, you know, in previous life, um, so I should say that coming to this conference, I'm actually more identified as an anarchist. Don't kill me. Um, so, and I've written, um, you know, quite a lot in my youth about um, the connection between anarchism and disability. 
and in a piece we call the queer queer creeping anarchism from a million years ago we try to propose this idea of um, um, D, DIT, uh, doing it together instead of DIY. DIY, you know, was then a very prevalent kind of thing within, especially green anarchy. Uh, you know, let's go back to the jungle and the roots and all that against the state and whatever. But the point <laughs> that we try to make is to talk about things like care collectives, which are viable abolitionist like things that are happening now beyond the state. I know three people that have care collectives, meaning. A care Collective, um, it's people who um, have personal assistance, but either the state won't pay for that or won't pay enough. And so people volunteer hours to be a part of these care collectives. Um, sometimes it's kind of mutual. Um, and I think this is something also really important that disability brings to the table of uh, whether you know, you're a socialist or anarchist or what have you, but you're interested in labor. Um, is that people with disabilities don't just uh, get cared for. They also uh, bring a lot to, to the table, um, and they also care for other people. And so care collectives are another example. The, all the networks of people that are, again, in psychosis or in crisis are another example. Um, and then also, if people are interested in actual policies, I think there was a question about that. You know, in the US, people really try to, for many years, um, disability activism, and this is not disability justice, this is like even just disability rights people, really try to push for this idea of money follows the person. So meaning that if a person gets disability benefits, it shouldn't go to the institution or the place, which if you don't know, this is exactly what's happening. Um, so the money, like if you get disability benefits and you live in a institution, whether it's private or state, um, so people often think about privatization, but that's not the beast we're fighting. We're fighting actually the state, um, in addition to privatization. But um, the money goes to the place, <laughs> not to the person. And so the idea is if the money goes to the person, then they can hire a uh, personal care attendant, including their family, which you know do a lot of the care uh, anyway or would want to. And this is in relation to the alternative. So yes, join that fight if you know kind of policy legalization is your jam, um, we need a lot of work. Um, we need a lot of um, work too, but we need a lot of help. And then um, lately, uh, lastly, um, I just want to say two things. Uh, one is about this idea of um, you know not leaving people behind the, um, in the no, uh, no new jail um, question. Um, First, I want to say um, just very briefly that for people who are interested in this nexus of disability, abolition, and um, decarceration, I have a lot of resources on my website. These are not necessarily things I wrote. I just put links to like a lot of organizations and things. And my website is just my name, uh, liatbenmoshe.com slash resources. And there's just links to like a bunch of stuff. So if people ask for podcasts and reading, blah, blah, there's just a lot of stuff there. Um, but also that this really kind of brings the question of what um, you know Andre Gore's um, G O R Z, I believe, uh, called non-reformist reforms, right? So this idea that we can't actually let people languish while we try to abolish the thing that we're trying to abolish, right? Like people can't die in prisons because we have this idea of okay, if you're moving to a different institution, like we failed, we have to. Uh, we do it like with the people, because we are the people. And so um, the non-reformist reform, I think, is really just us on the ground figuring out, OK, we have an abolitionist horizon, but what are the steps like to achieving it while not like losing people in the process? So um, I think I will open it up uh, again. And then if I have time, I'll talk about the question of corrections and rehabilitation. OK, so unfortunately, um those speakers' list is closed. I'm going to do my best to get everybody who had their hand up on the list. The next person I have is this person here in the black dress. Um, and that's going to be followed by there's a person over here wearing a black face mask that has yellow kind of polka dots on it. And we're going to follow that up with the person in the blue jumpsuit, right? OK. Hello. Hello. My name is Ingrid. And um, I'm in an organization called Beyond the Bars in Miami, Florida. Um, I was considered, well, I am, disabled. I'm schizophrenic bipolar. 
And for many years, my family didn't know what was going on with me, nor did I. You know, I was in institutions, crisis. You know, they labeled me as soon as I went to, as soon as I went to jail, I was, at, you know, hearing voices and everything. When they arrested me, they took me right to jail and I was in orange. You know, I was in orange. Um, I've been on mid, plenty, many, many medications. I'm over 50 years old, but I've been on many, many medications. You know, um, it's kind of, cr it, it, and the medication they had me on, I was like a zombie, you know, a zombie. And um, um, been depressed and everything. I want to cry, but yeah. But um, <laughs> I just want to say that, you know, you, you know, I get scared. I get I get scared when I hear people you know talking you know about the jails and everything because I've been I've gone to jail you know for something that didn't know what was going on with me and how they labeled me you know and then getting there and how they treated me you know and I used to say to myself get on I used to say to myself God please let someone you know, let someone understand me you know let someone understand me but um you know, working wise and everything, I became a member of, um, a member of the organization Beyond the Bars, and they've given me a chance. You know, they 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 they've they've looked inside of me, outside of me, the, the beauty that I have in me now. You know, and I just want to say thank you. Um, hello, and thank you for, for being here, and thank you for everyone for selecting to be here as well. Um, I'm also a member of Beyond the Bars um, and an organizer, and what I have seen, we advocate for people who are incarcerated, um, and what we have seen is every time we go to like the courts for, for our people, they try to delegitimize like us as their advocates. They're like, what are your interests, knowing like the state? So <laughs> they challenge us the way we challenge them, so how could we counter that? You know, I guess that's kind of my question. Hi, can you hear me? My name is Kevin Sanapathy, and I'm a journalist here reporting on uh, a book about uh, parenting for people with progressive values. I also have obsessive compulsive disorder and chronic pain. And I was wondering if you could speak to the discourse around mental health and violence, for example, with adolescents and school shootings, and the, um, the lack of awareness of the heterogeneity of mental health conditions. So specifically, uh, as it has to do with the content of our thoughts and the potential involvement of social workers and child protective services. So I have four more speakers on the list, and then we'll let Leah close us out. Um, so next up, I have, there is someone wearing a white shirt next to the person in, in green. Yep, so you're next. And then that's gonna be followed by the tan jacket right here. Yep, that's you. Um, and then there's somebody wearing a gray jacket. Yep, uh, yep, you. And then right next to you after that. And that'll close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I am a mother, my name is Tammy, I'm a mother of a child with a neurological differences and developmental uh, differences and um, also a co-founder of Mothers on the Front Line. And I would love to hear your advice about how to coalition with parents. We're trying to build a children's mental health justice framework for exactly these issues. And I just wanted to raise a few of them because we focus on the lived experience of caregivers trying to navigate these very oppressive and carceral systems. And what often happens is parents are put in a position that they're trying to prevent their children from falling into school to prison pipeline policies of seclusion, restraint, and suspension prevent them from being actually incarcerated and as a result end up over medicating them or putting them in other carceral treatment systems. And so how might we all coalition together to prevent that? And the other piece of it is because of our patriarchal system, it is mostly mothers doing this care work or female or feminized relatives. 
and we are being disabled by our care work. I have complex trauma and um, 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 PTSD, but it's not from my child. And this is what we need to talk about. It's from the institutions that have traumatized my family. I'm afraid my other children will be taken away because of what's going on with him. I'm afraid the police will get to the school before I do because they don't know how to help accommodate his needs. So I don't know if that, but I would love to hear how we can coalition with parents rather than having this kind of division we seem to have in the activism world. Thank you. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, uh, I'm just Okay, what about now? Um, my name is Amber. Um, I'm, well, I'm with uh, DSA Fort Worth. Um, I was born and raised in Texas. Um, but I'm also, um, I, I think I'm transitioning away from being a social worker as well. Um, and I'm a doctoral student um, in a criminology and criminal justice program. And um, I have also worked in patient psych. And so I have a, you know, a lot of, um, experience on you know both sides of these institutional settings and I really feel like there's um, kind of a, a lack of understanding of what you know it means to prescribe a like mental health treatment or what you know like the mental health field really does or looks like or can do and definitely a lack of understanding of the class nature of mental health care and mental health treatment, um, both for people with addiction, but also people um, with you know serious mental health issues. And I feel like maybe as organizers and um, you know advocates, we could maybe be doing more to kind of break down what it means because it's, it tends to just be like a one-sized-fits-all thing. Like oh, people you know in in prison are disproportionately you know, diagnosed with mental health problems. Like, let's send some mental health treatment people in there, let's send some social workers in there, and we're gonna do mental health care, and that's just gonna make everything better. Um, and after working, you know, in public, <laughs> publicly funded mental health programs, um, you know, I think that a lot of people are, um, don't realize that, you know, it's not like on television, you know, it's like you're not gonna always sit down with a therapist or even see the same therapist like more than once. And there's just a lot of limitations to what it's able to do. Um, and so I was wondering if you think that, um, you know, that's something that could be maybe a little bit like better defined, you know, by those of us who are abolitionists. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could speak a little bit to the, the role of, um, competence, um, or I guess perceived competence, like among people with disabilities um, and within these institutional settings, because I feel like what it really comes down to, you know, from a public standpoint, and even those of us who, you know, work with um, impacted individuals, <laughs> um, there's just a, a lack of, a, some, I, I guess people just don't feel that people are competent enough to make their own choices. Um, and that's really like one of the major problems with institutionalization, both in you know, criminal justice and also in you know, mental health, um, is that people just don't find um, or feel that people are, are you know, able to make good choices for themselves, um, make good decisions, make their own. Um, you know, they, we're supposed to like, be like, um, up, comrade? Um, I guess it's just like a lack of like assumptions of people's ability to self-determination. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the last two speakers to come up together and then we'll, we're going to go over about five minutes if that's okay. Um, so that Leah can come back in for, a, for a five to close us out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Hayes, and um, I just wanted to reinforce something that I've been hearing around um, treatment. Um, I spent uh, the better part of my 20s uh, struggling with heroin addiction and a slew of uh, mental health diagnoses, so experienced jail uh, repeatedly and also experienced institutionalization repeatedly. And I don't think that a lot of people understand how similar these experiences can be. And that when something is positioned as an alternative to something um, punitive, that it takes on those same qualities. 
that people start to emulate the prison system within things that are being positioned as alternatives to. So a number of the kinds of dehumanizing experiences that I had in jails, I also had in mental health facilities. And I've been at the expensive ones where you go if you have good insurance, and I've been at the ones where they send you when you're homeless and you have nothing. And in both, deeply dehumanizing experiences and some of the things that we hear about in jails, um, people being denied um, sort of um, sanitary napkins and things like that when dealing with menstruation, um, people um, being, um, I can think of one time when I was at a, a rather nice psychiatric facility and someone was, uh, they did a random blood draw, you know, there are those of us who were there for uh, chemical stuff. And the person didn't change their gloves between taking blood from people. And I was like, I'd appreciate it if you would change your gloves uh, before drawing my blood. And she said, these are for my protection, not yours. If you don't let me do this, you're getting written up. And like, how is that any different than what happens in prison? It's, it's the same sort of thing. And I, I just want people to, to recognize that, that that positioning is an alternative as opposed to growing the things that we want because they need to exist for us, not because we need this instead of. It will always, always, always lead to the replication of those dynamics. I can't tell you how many times I was told how lucky I was to be in treatment instead of in jail. And I was like, hey, I checked myself in here to try to get some, some medical care. And you're telling me I'm lucky that I'm not in jail? So I want us to think about the extent to which people receiving treatment are already being treated like people who are inside of penal facilities. And I just want us to be, to be very aware of those ongoing traumas and that a lot of the same sort of experiences are happening in these spaces. Hi, my name is Cheryl. I'm from uh, Brooklyn. And uh, I was thinking a little bit about like how do we get the care that we, we need and how can people provide care to each other without uh, burning out without you know like the reliance on institutional spaces because typically it seems like first step is someone needs care it's usually in the nuclear family and then it's like we, we, we don't have the resources or like we're burnt out or like this is too much so then there's institutions and I, I'm wondering how much um, we could link this back to like the abolition of the nuclear family and starting new family forms so that the family is a much bigger space that there's much more care available because we're not limiting it to this like nuclear uh, blood type like family uh, orientation and instead creating a different type of family. And I'm thinking a lot about what that means, like the resources that you need for that, but how do you even just start that right now uh, for myself as I'm considering, will I have kids? What does it look like to have children and not have them in this way that I was raised in a nuclear family where my family did not know what to do with any of my problems? And I was lucky enough that this didn't lead to like, they, they tried to like institutionalize me or stuff and said they were like, you know, those problems aren't real. But like, what does it look like to actually create a space where we have enough people, we have enough resources, we're collectively sharing those, so that the care collective doesn't have to be built when you're an adult. It's like built from the time that, when you're born. Like you are being born into a care collective. Thank you. Um, so I wanna do two things instead of um, me talking. I wonder, um, Tammy, um, there's a page here that says parent advocacy and family advocacy, also for Cheryl. If you want to just collect, like, email, let's do this. I mean, you asked for who wants to be a part. Um, people can, I mean, there's a lot of you in the room. Put your emails, get connected. Um, I'm also a parent, by the way, of a disabled, um, now adult, um, in college. Um, but um, yeah, send it around. And then the second page um, is just called Disability and Abolition. If people want to just get connected around no new jails or like other campaigns or whatever, I don't know what we'll do with these pages. I mean, maybe Tammy will take that one. I don't know. I don't know Tammy, by the way. We <laughs> literally just nothing. Okay, but um, yeah. Um, so instead of just you listening to me, let's like do the thing. Um, I'll figure what to do with that least, <laughs> at, le at least. Um, and then, you know, just to throw away some kind of res resources, um, 
So first of all, Kelly, who just spoke. Kelly, do you want to plug in like any of your stuff? Everybody should like. <laughs> oh, everything you want. Anything Kelly does amazing. So movement memos and lif um, uh, lifted voices. Um, the other thing you might want to look at um, is uh, you know, a variety of people who talk about like non-coercive. I mean, that's really kind of the issue, right? Like non-coercive and consensual um, uh, things that are um, abolitionary. But like Kelly was saying, it's really important not to talk about alternatives. Because think about if we would say words like, um, I have an alternative to eugenics. You know, <laughs> an alternative to genocide would be, you know, th that is nonsensical, right? So, I mean, we should exactly do the same with incarceration. It should make no sense to us whatsoever. Um, and I think that that's really, um, if it wasn't clear, like one of the deep kind of lessons from deinstitutionalization too is like if we understand disability differently and we understand. Um, madness differently, then it would make no sense to us. Um, and lastly, I just want to say um, to Edward and to other people, I, I don't conflate medical care with medicalization. Like, I think those are different things. I think medicalization is this kind of pathologization that we do. Um, it's a thing that makes something like uh, giving birth, for example, it gets medicalized. A lot of things like get medicalized. but. Medical care is something we should all have for just living. So I think we can talk about um, what like affirmative medical care uh, and mental care would mean. But I, I don't think medicalization is the same thing. Medicalization is like the oppressive um, side of it. So, um, and I think this is like kind of confuses people. Um, I, I don't think people with disabilities are against getting like what we need. I think we are just against the medicalization of our uh, political identities. Um, so thank you very much for being here. And I will, I will collect the list as it kind of goes around and I hope um, you all uh, put yourself on it and we'll figure out what to do and how to change the world. Thank you.